February is Black History Month. So, you know, the memories are bound for me, like we're reminiscing now about growing up and people that catapult you to this position. So a lot of people ask me about my dress. Like, man, why do you dress like that? Okay, so when we were growing up, and you go downtown, your parents tell you, you got to wear your best clothes, <laughs> you put on your best manners. Right. You're not only representing the family, you're representing your race. So that was kind of etched in your mind. So whenever you did something, like when we were on the bus and we were sitting, if women got on, we got up and gave them our seat. Mm -hmm. So all of these things were stressed by our parents, our coaches, our teachers. In those days, your manners meant more than your jump shot. And of course, <laughs> education, education yeah. was your way out. Yeah, well, you know, I never thought about going to college. Um, you know, I, I kind of, kind of um, bounced here and bounced there, um, whichever way the ball rolled. You know, I was going that way. Um, it wasn't until I was out of out of high school that I decided that hey, maybe I better go to college. And um, there was a guy I, I worked for a year at a place on a knitting mill in New in Philadelphia. And this guy used to talk about um, equality all the time. He was a little guy, wore a tam, uh, smoked a pipe, and he ran the elevator. And he used to go, go up and down. So he used to talk about, you know, equality, equality. And me just being out of high school, I never really got into, you know, you know the history of, of what it was all about, you know, of black people in America. I've heard of certain things, but we never were told, we never were taught those kind of things in high school. So I didn't really have a, a, a grasp as to exactly what he meant. And then when I went to college in, in North Carolina, it came full circle. <laughs> right. You know, you know, I understood what he meant. And the the year that Martin Luther King was Marshall, they Marshall Washington, I was working at the time and I decided, okay, that was a day off, you know, they gave everyone a day off. I took a day off and I didn't go. And when I went to college, you know, I understood exactly why he was marching on Washington. And it's like a void in my life that I never got a chance to meet Martin Luther King. And as, you know, the years went on, um, as I played basketball in college and, and then he was in Winston-Salem at one point, um, we were out of town. I wasn't able to see him. Then he passed away. And that's when we, our first year in, 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 the, in the pros in 68. So it was, a, it was a terrible thing for me, and I've always uh, missed not being able to see him. Yeah, I think for me, uh, growing up under depression and segregation was a blessing because our, my parents, my teachers, they used it as a carrot to to tempt you because when people say that you can't do something, they treat you as a second class mm -hmm. citizen, it's a galvanizer. So mm -hmm. you want to prove them wrong. So my parents would always tell me, yeah, you could be whatever you want to be, but you got to apply yourself, you know? Mm -hmm. So I remember in football, I was a quarterback. Yeah. So I'd throw two or three touchdowns, man, and I'd be bragging and the coach would bring me a paper where the white guy scored four touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> so same thing in basketball, you know, I scored 25 points, he'd bring me the paper. Oh, man, but the guy over here, he had 25 and 15 rebounds, you know. So when you're young, you don't understand that, but what he was doing was you can't rest on your laurels, son. You mm -hmm. know, you got to be twice as good as those guys in order exactly. to get the job. So. And that way you develop a tenacious work ethic. Yeah, the work ethic is what it's all about. I, you know, I, I'm glad that I was able to go to school in North Carolina and, and be with a coach like um, Coach Gaines, Clarence Gaines. Because, as you said, my game would not have resonated maybe in a, a lot of other programs. And he gave me the opportunity to kind of expand myself and, and be myself. And I think, you know, in terms of a father figure and things of that nature, he was my father figure. Um, I grew up, you know, my, my father wasn't around. I didn't see my father between the ages of five and, and 19. And he became that figure for me. And when I saw my father, an interesting thing, when I saw my father, I wasn't angry that he wasn't around 
because by being in college and getting an understanding of people, I understood that sometimes, you know, people don't get along. And it's not my fault that they didn't get along, it's their fault. And I'm, it's not for me to blame. And I accepted him for that and he always came to me and always said to me before he passed away, he said, Earl, I could never understand how you could be, you know, so forgiving at a time when you really needed me and I wasn't there. And um, I said, that's okay. Ma took care of it. <laughs> right. that's, you know, ironically in the NBA, that's the case a lot of times. It's the matriarch, the mothers are the catalyst for the family. There's not really mm -hmm. a male model there. But in those days, the coaches were always a surrogate parent. Right. They made you do right, you know, <laughs> do the right thing, go to class, stay out of trouble. So that was real a real blessing for us yeah that we didn't really know you know that sometimes we hated it because they seemed so strict but now once you get up and you see like when i when i came to new york you know i was well prepared man like i had my focus and uh you know my parents had taught me certain things i was like well i don't want to do that i know everybody <laughs> else is doing that man but my thing was always when I was faced with temptation, what would my mother think? And that's exactly what it was like. You know, mom always took care of you. She always gave you the perspective of knowing what was out there. And I kind of grasped that myself because even my younger sister, I would never chastise her. When everything would happen, I would just take her, go walk in the park, and we sit down and we just talk about it. And um, after we talk about it, she'd understand what it is that she did, what she did wrong when she ran away, why she ran away, that she shouldn't have done that. And it, it brought us all closer together. I'm very fortunate, I tell you. Um, I never thought about playing basketball. Um, you know, I, I shot the ball, you know, at the vacation Bible school, but I didn't really get to start playing basketball until I was um, about 13. 14. I and hate I, you ever started. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, how you went off to college to experience se segregation. And, mm -hmm. You know, and I grew up with that in Atlanta, Georgia, <laughs> and then I experienced integration when I went off to college. But, you know, being the oldest of nine kids, seven sisters, and one brother, so, <laughs> you know, I was a role model before I knew what the word meant. Mm -hmm. When my parents weren't around, I was in charge, and so I, that really helped me with my leadership skills. Because mm -hmm. my mom was always telling me, Walt, you got to do this, you got to do that. Then when I got into sports, the coaches were doing the same thing. So that's kind of why I developed the poker face. <laughs> you know, obviously on the inside I was percolating, right. but outside I was looking cool because I had to tell the guys the plays and do my <laughs> sister tell them what to do. So that was a valuable experience for me growing up. Well, you know, I was the middle child. I had two sisters and... Um, but even at that, I was really the baby of the family. Everybody kind of took care of me. And being in Philadelphia, um, you know, there was a lot of things going around. Uh, you know, gang wars here, race riots here, and things of that nature. So, you know, what I experienced coming up uh, is a lot of who I am today. Um, certainly, uh, my mother is probably the, the catalyst for, for me, when you think about in terms of basketball, in terms of being a person, um, she's the one who gave me the little notebook when I couldn't play and said, write those guys' names down. And when you get better than them, you know, just scratch those names off. So, you know, she was the one who kind of kept me up. And one of the strangest things that happened to me when I was um, growing up, like I didn't really do a lot of work. I didn't do a whole bunch of stuff because my mom did it all. So I had a paper route, and my mom um, delivered the papers after she came home from work for me. And one day she was delivering the papers, she went up into a house and, and somebody said, um, 
to their mother, Mom, it's the paper lady. And when I heard that, it hurt me. And it kind of made me want to do for her, become successful, do things that I could, whatever it is, to make her happy. And, um, you know, all the other things that happened to me in my life are, was reverted around that particular sentence right there. Yeah, that's ironic for me, too. Mine was, my mom was always talking about a house with a big kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I can remember I, I, at night I used to pray, God, please let me be a basketball player, football <laughs> player, baseball, so I can help my mom buy this house. Mm -hmm. So she was catalytic in me being in sports. I was lucky the playground was only three blocks from my house. Mm -hmm. So if you ever came and I said, Miss Frazier, where's Walt? Go down to the playground. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one lady that used to be over the equipment. Mm -hmm. So there were never any parents down there. It was just the kids <laughs> that came down and played. And if it rained, we played checkers and ping pong. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yeah. all we ever wanted to do was play sports. And growing up in the South, we didn't really have a lot of gangs. You know, there were mm -hmm. a few guys that tried to be in gangs and stuff, but we had, you know, we never locked the doors. We didn't really have <laughs> keys to the house. So <laughs> it was a real revelation. Like when I hear guys from, like you saying, from the North, the things that you were tempted with that I never had to deal with. Yeah, you talk about never having gangs. We had guys and names like Gang or Butch and things like that. So, you know, they, they was very, very prevalent. Uh, uh, you know, I, you know, just like you say, there's always somebody in the neighborhood that really takes it upon themselves to help the kids out. And there was a lady in our neighborhood as well by the name of Mabel Wilson. And I played with her sons and things of that nature. But she had a, she put together a, what they called a vacation Bible school. And the vacation Bible school was basically a lot, dirt lock where there used to be a house. And she put, um, you know, chairs and tables and, and whatnot there. Now we lived on a, on a street that was a dirt street. The, the pavements were paved, but the streets was dirt. And across the street was um, what we call Cowboy Hill. It was the train tracks. And that's where we played, the Cowboy Hill and, and whatnot. But Miss Mabel took us and took us under her wings. And every kid in the neighborhood every summer was at Vacation Bible School. And it's the first time I even shot a basketball because they put a, a, a little basket right in front of the, um, uh, the post in front of the um, Vacation Bible School. And we used to shoot spots going back. And um, so that's why I figured that um, when they called me Black Jesus, that it all started a vacation Bible school. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. You know, plus in the South, we didn't have uh, asphalt. Oh. <laughs> you know, they couldn't afford it, so we always played on dirt. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you get a heavy rain, so you have this soil erosion. So you got that really helped out dribbling. <laughs> you know, you got to dribble over different spots on the court. But you speaking of neighborhoods and the older people. You know, I know it sounds clicheish to say you were raised by a village, but I was mm -hmm. really raised by that village. Parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, right. teachers, coaches, even my peers. So when I was fourth grade, I'm playing against sixth and seventh graders. So when these guys were going to do something like smoking, can you imagine those days smoking <laughs> doing something bad? Or drinking, they would run me home. They never allowed me to smoke or drink or gamble. So they're going, no, man, you're going to be a ball player. You know, get out of here. You're not going to do this. So uh, my peers and everybody played a valuable part in my sitting here now talking about success. <laughs> wow, you know, it's been a long time. And so, you know, I guess the main thing is that what they tried to instill in us a long time ago is still here. And um, in a lot of respects, we try to do the same thing with other kids out there as, as we've grown up and, and we've seen things that have gone on in neighborhoods and things of that nature. I'm very fortunate, I tell you. Um, I never thought about playing basketball. Um, you know, I, I shot the ball, you know, at the vacation Bible school, but I didn't really get to start playing basketball until I was um, about 13, 14. 
I hate you ever started. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's wonderful living there. And then for me, when I step out, I'm like the mayor. Yeah. You know, everybody, Clyde, Clyde, give me a picture. <laughs> Clyde, Clyde, give me an autograph, you know. So it's nice to see what's happened up there. I know you were really into music. How did that start <laughs> for you? I mean, I grew up with Motown. You know, I like the Motown sound. Couldn't Ooh. dance a lick in high school or college, but just loved it. So I can't believe now all I listen to are the uh, Soul, Soul Town. Soul Town, okay. And I can remember those songs back like yesterday. If I hear one playing, I know who that is. Percy oh. Sledge, all these different <laughs> people. But I know you were in the music business and yeah, well, you know, there was a guy who used to come through our house by the name of Solomon Burke, and oh, he's actually Solomon in Burke, the yeah. um, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And um, he used to come by, and he used to, you know, with my sister and my cousins and whatnot, and I thought he was a relative, as a matter of fact. And then my, uh, later on, when my sister got married, her husband managed a group called The Intruders, and his uh, cousin was in the Delphonics. So, you know, Philadelphia was like a music haven at that time. And that's how I got more involved with the music. And, of course, when I got to New York, um, I met two guys, the Alain mm -hmm. twins, who um, uh, they were in Jimi Hendrix's last band. And what's interesting is that Jimi Hendrix's uh, birthday was a couple, about a month or so ago, and they had in the paper the twins, the Aline twins. And I didn't realize that Jimi Hendrix had given them the name uh, that they came to me with that I started managing with, which was the Ghetto Fighters. So, um, you know, music has always been a part of, you know, growing up and, you know, and also part of my game because my game was like more rhythmic, you know, rhythmic and whatnot. So, you know, music has been a big part of me. So how ironic now, I used to party all the time in Harlem, Wilts, hey, hey. Small, Small's Paradise. Yeah. Never thought of living there. <laughs> and now I know you've been there longer than me. I've been there maybe eight years, and you've been yeah, there a little longer. 15 so, years, yeah. Yeah, the metamorphosis that Harlem has undergone. Yeah, it's, um, it's great to see. I mean, I mean, even when I was living downtown, you know, I used to come up to Harlem, and, uh, you know, it's... Uh, you know, it, it, again, it was the music, it was all the other things that was going on there, the ambiance of Harlem at that time. But um, now it's made a metamorphosis, and um, the metamorphosis is even, <clears throat> I guess, is better and, than it was before because what it's done is it's bringing a more diverse group of people together. And one thing I always thought about Harlem, and I, I thought was really a, a downfall, is that People more or less, you know, they just said, okay, uh, we're not going to buck the system anymore. We don't want it to gravitate to anything else. This is where we are. This is what we want to do. And now with new people coming in, you know, they're demanding more services and things of that nature. And I think in terms of that, um, you know, Harlem has really grown. Yeah, this is definitely a melting pot. You know, with all the, the restaurants, I can get sushi now. <laughs> you know, we got, uh, what's well, this? you don't like sushi. <laughs> yeah, I, I like the you eel. Eat, you eat across the street a lot. Of <laughs> oh, yeah, I can get my man Jacob. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful living there. And then for me, mm. when I step out, I'm like the mayor. Yeah. You know, everybody, Clyde, Clyde, give me a picture. Clyde, Clyde, give me an autograph, you know. So it's nice to see what's happened up there. And, uh, but a lot of people complain about gentrification, that they're running mm -hmm. out the, the older people that are living in a neighborhood they can no longer afford it, so. Well, you know, that's true, especially, you know, I live in a building. So uh, the building, you know, has a lot of older people in it. And, you know, what's interesting, we're talking about older people. You know, we're, the, we're those people now. Yeah, I know, <laughs> can you believe it? Right. <laughs> time flies, man. Time flies, yeah. time flies. One of the things that made our team kind of unique is that we had guys on the team that was 
pretty indicative of what the makeup of New York was. We might not have worked out if, the, if it was the day me coming to New York. Right, yeah, that too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But I, I tell people you were the catalyst for that, that happening. Uh, you know, they said we need two basketballs. It would never work. But they forgot our mutual respect for each other from being opponents. So when you came to the team, mm -hmm. we never let our egos get involved. So, Well, you know, the other thing about that is they were writers, man. They never even played the game. Right, so, and they have their favorites, you know. Exactly. Some guys like you, some guys like me. So I think they, in a way, they didn't want it to work. Yeah, but uh, we fooled up. Yeah, but like you say, it's basketball, <laughs> man. You told, said you told them you're. I'm a basketball player, yeah. man. In in Baltimore, they wanted me to shoot. Yeah. Yeah. So now you know I have to change my game. And I wanted to shoot. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my thing, defense, I, I see, I cringe now when I see the lack of defense being played today, man. The guys just, how could Curry, the best shooter in the league, be standing uncontested? Well, they made the rules so that, you know, the game is now more offensive and that you can't touch anybody. Um, that's why he's out there by himself. Um, and the switching. No switching. You know, little guys, I told guy, man, you know, when a big guy switch on a, on a little guy, I said, you know what Willis Reed would have told me? <laughs> he's got to go out and go at Oscar Robinson and Jerry West, <laughs> man. That ain't happening. No, man. no. And no. then I told guys where to like guarding you and Pistol Pete, I said, I don't want anybody else to guard them. Because <laughs> when they get hot, I want them to get hot on me and not <laughs> on somebody else. So that's just making my life more miserable, well, so I'm not switching. Well, thinking about that, you know, Pistol Pete, they can get 68 on us. <laughs> yeah, I remember the, the one game, right, right. I tell people, I said, you know, I started out on him. He got six points on me. The rest of him he got on Clyde and Butch Beard. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody did the thing, like, yeah, most of us play like 15 minutes. I think I played 15, Dean. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, everybody played. <laughs> but I was just thinking, that luckily that was not a three-point shot. He would have had 100 that game, man. Oh, right. Yeah, sure. he was shooting down his head, man. Yeah. One of the things that made our team kind of unique is that we had guys on the team that was pretty indicative of what the makeup of New York was. Everybody in New York could identify with the people on the, on the, on the, there was the, you know, you got the DeBush, you know, the, the working guys guy who came in every night, he rebounded, you know, he played defense, he made the shot and whatnot. You know, you had the intellectuals with Bill and, and, and um, uh, Jerry Lucas and so forth. And, uh, and you know, we had Red Holtzman. Right, yeah. Who was a no-nonsense guy, he was colorblind, he never saw color. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why the players always gave 110 percent for him. Yeah, and I and I I was it was different, you know, coming here because, you know, coaches usually just tell you what to do, but Red was the kind of coach that, you know, he kind of let you say something in a huddle or say, and if he didn't like it, he said, "Oh, that's horse. We're not going to do that. Right. We're going to do this." But if it's not right. And he'll let you go and do what you're supposed to do. I mean, when you think in terms of it was such a veteran team. I mean, you had going back to DeBusher, who was also a coach before he even got to the, to the Knicks. And then you had, you know, all-stars yourself. You had Willis. You had Dick Barnett. You had guys who understood the game, who played the game, Bill Bradley. So, you know, it was a very, very unique kind of um, – team that we had and I think that's the reason why even after all these years you know we're still pretty close in, in terms of all the guys that have you know played on those teams. Yeah, Red was definitely the right coach at the right time. Yeah. Symbolic of a player's coach. Uh, like you said we could always come in and, and talk to him put in plays but I like I always say he was hard but fair. Mm -hmm. You could do that when you're winning. <laughs> right. But when you're losing, it's all Red's way. You're not putting in things. You, you know, he cracks the whip, and that's the way it should be. Yeah. You know, if you're not winning games. So being in New York, I never felt the racism. Obviously, when you go south to Atlanta, D 
different teams, you know, Kansas City that they had in the league at the time. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was a wonderful experience for me. And I was very cognizant of that, of course, growing up in the South and going off to school in Southern Illinois. Uh, I never felt the, the, the racism uh, in New York City. Well, I, I felt a little bit of it uh, having come here. And, and after one of the playoff games that we, we had at the Garden, we were going to the um, uh, LaGuardia. I always went by myself or, you know, drove the car, you don't have my girlfriend, and we'd go to the uh, airport and she'd drive back. And on my way to the parking lot, I got jumped by four guys. Um, I was a little late for the airplane, and um, they, you know they talking a lot of stuff to me. So uh, when I got to the airplane, of course, Red was there with his watch in his hand, <laughs> as usual, <laughs> tell me how. <laughs> and I just brushed by it because I was actually mad that I couldn't go back and confront these guys. But, um, but other than that, you know, my experience with um, New York was, has been, you know, exquisite. Um, when I came here the first time, I had to make a decision that when I stopped playing for the Bullets, I went to Philadelphia first, and my agent at the time, Larry Flasher, called me and said, well, I got a deal for you. With, I said, fool. He said, with the Knicks. I, I said, what? <laughs> I said, they are a mortal, mortal enemy, man. What do you mean? He said, man, he said, listen, uh, I want to see you play every day here in New York. And I said, well, let me, I'm going to go home and think about it. So when I went home and then I drove a, a car up here and I came on 40th and 11th Avenue and I looked at what was going on here and, I, and it was about 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> and I said to myself, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the energy of the city. Oh, man, is unbelievable.